and welcome to the second ECG round. We are glad to welcome you to this second appointment that will be take place monthly with the online education in cardiology. Before to introduce our speaker, Professor Roberto Santilli, let me remember you that you can post your question on the Q&A session since the starting of the event and we'll post to our speaker at the end of the lecture. Anyway, if you are following on Facebook group, please post in the same way your question in the comments and we will keep and post to our speaker. Now I'm glad to introduce you uh, Professor Roberto Santilli. He is graduated from the College of Veterinary Medicine of the University of Milan, and he became a diplomat of the European College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, Companion Animal Speciality of Cardiology. Between 24 and 26, he completed the Master in Electrophysiology and Electrical Stimulation of the University of Medicine of Subria. He then obtained a PhD at the University of Turin, College of Veterinary and Internal Medicine. Roberto Santilli is the head of the Cardiology Department of the Clinica Malpensa Anicura in Samarate and of the Ospe Ospedale Veterinario I Portoni Rossi Anicura close to Bologna. Since 2014, he has been a junk professor of cardiology at the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine, where he is actively involved in the activities of the, in the cardiac electrophysiology laboratory. He is co-author of the book Electrocardiography of the Dog and Cat, now translated into seven languages. His main research activities include diagnosis and treatment of arrhythmias in dog and cats. Welcome, Professor Roberto Santilli, and please share your screen um, perfectly. I see very well, and uh, let you the stage. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alessia. Uh, welcome, everybody. So today we will talk about atrial fibrillation. As you know, atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmias in dogs. It's a little bit more rare in cats, but for dogs it's probably the, uh, the arrhythmia that everybody can recognize and can handle. So what we want to do today is just give you some new insight on the ECG features of, of atrial fibrillation and to give some insights on uh, diagnosis of different types of atrial fibrillation. So let's start with an ECG. And you, these, this ECG is from a Cavalier King Charles uh, dog. It's a, uh, a dog uh, of 10 years old. And this dog had uh, mitral valve disease, as you can imagine. So what you see on this ECG is a narrow QRS complex tachycardia, as you can see here. And you will see with irregular RR interval and with no P waves. And instead of P waves, you can see some uh, uh, small F waves. So when you have irregular RR interval, irregular RR interval, so most of us believe that is just due to the changes in the refractory period of the AV node. As you know, the AV node is a filter, and this is probably true, but this is not just this the problem, because there are some studies that show that the action of the AV node is just to scale the atrial impulses. So, but this, it, it has no a primary role in determining the irregularity of the RR interval. So we know that atrial fibrillation is a, a, is a, um, uh, a re-entry. Usually this type of re-entry is very, very irregular. And so you have the RR interval is irregular because you have an irregularity of an AA interval or FF interval. So atrial fibrillation 
is, is a different type of reentry. For example, when we talk about atrial flutter, this is an anatomical reentry. And so it's very regular and the waves are very monomorphic. In atrial fibrillation is a functional reentry. And so the AA or atrial atrial, or better the FF interval is irregular. So this is the main reason why you have irregular RR interval. Excuse me, Roberto, could yes? you please hide the bar on yeah, the I just, bottom? I, I did it, I did it because okay. we thanks a lot, thanks a lot. So the role of it, or AV node is confined to the scaling of atrial activity. So it's trying to filter atrial activity, but irregularity is mainly due to the uh, changes in and the variation of the AA interval. So we know there are F waves. So usually we look at lead B2 and we see there is no P waves and there is this fibrillation wave, usually a very tiny wave. But let's go more into this, considering that atrial fibrillation can be classified in four different forms. And so, and that's why the morphology and the amplitude of the F way are very, very important Try to do this differential. So we don't know for dogs and even uh, less for cats, but usually for dogs, we can uh, try to define if the atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal, it's persistent, or long-standing, persistent, or permanent. So paroxysmal, you will see some example today, but usually for human, is an atrial fibrillation that is self-limiting within 48 hours or maximum seven days. We don't know this timing for dogs, but usually you will see some example of paroxysmal AFib during halters when you see that uh, atrial fibrillation is self-limiting, so you can call paroxysmal. Then we move into the persistent. Persistent is when if uh, you can cardiovert into a sinus rhythm using drugs or using electrical cardioversion. It's permanent when despite the use of antiarrhythmics or despite the use of cardioversion, it cannot go back into sinus. So let's concentrate on persistent atrial fibrillation. So you, we have this differential and I'll show you how to do this differential with, with CCG. So persistent atrial uh, fibrillation is when it lasts uh, less than, um, sorry, when uh, in, for human it's less than one year. And it's long-standing persistent if it's more than one year. And we don't know for dogs the exact timing. So we are now trying to do a study where we follow over time the uh, dogs with persistent atrial fibrillation and trying to see when they go into long-standing persistent. Okay, so this is the main classification of atrial fibrillation, so paroxysmal, persistent, long-standing, persistent, and permanent. So why is this important? Because as soon as there is the first diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, you will have still the variation in the atrial myocardium. It's, it's an anatomical remodeling, electrical remodeling, so when you have paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation, you have some form of remodeling, but there are still there, are, there is some still some uh, coordination in the contraction. And you will see that this will make the F wave of atrial fibrillation more organized. When you move into long-standing persistence, so for human more than one year, for dog. We have a rough idea that is from three to six months post uh, the initiation of atrial fibrillation. The remodeling is severe. So you have electrical remodeling, infiltration of lymphocytes, plasma cells, fibrofatty tissue. And so 
the, there is a, an atrial fibrillation that is no more coordinated, and this will induce a more coarse variation of the F wave. And this is even worse when you move into permanent atrial fibrillation. So if you want to do the differential between paroxysmal and persistent, they are very similar, and then you want to differentiate from long-standing persistent, we have to concentrate on the F wave. So we have to look on the F wave, and I'll show you in a different lead how to do it. It's important, as we saw already last time, so to use our new precordial system. For the one of you that have not yet started using it, just write to me, I can give you the, uh, the paper. But it's important to put V1 in the first right intercostal space here, in the midway, close to the sternum, in the midway here, and then in the sixth intercostal space on the left from V2 to V6. So starting from the costochondral junction to uh, sternochondral junction, sorry, V2, and costochondral junction, V4, and then equidistant, you put V3, V5, and V6. So why is this important? There is different study in human where they look at the amplitude, regularity, and rate of the F wave, try to define if it's long-standing, persistent, or not. In why are we using these three leads? So lead two, lead AVL, and lead V1. So lead two is the inter, sorry, it's a mistake here, is the interatrial septum. So we are looking at the muscle of the interatrial septum in dogs. AVL is the left atrium. And lead V1 is the right atrium. So if you look in this, three leads, you can have a, a rough idea how it's organized the depolarization of the atria in the interatrial septum, left atrium, and right atrium. Let's start from this dog. This is a Bernese dog, eight years old. If you look at the interatrial septum, you see here, this is an acute onset AFib. You see that the atrial fibrillation waves are more organized. Still irregular, so it's very unlikely with the functional reentry that you have a, a constant FF interval, and also the morphology of the F way is variable, but they are very, very visible, as you can see here. So this is the interatrial septum that is fibrillating in an organized manner. Then we move to the left atrium. You see now that the left atrium is very different. It's kind of flat, and the F way are barely visible. And this is normal because we know that the left atrium is usually the atria where the, the atrial fibrillation starts, where the remodeling is more pronounced. So usually the a left atrium is where the, the atrial fibrillation is usually more uh, coarse and disorganized. And then look at this one here. This is a Labrador, and look at the atrial fibrillation in this lab. You can see it here again, it's an acute onset. Look at the F wave. They are very, very visible high amplitude. We don't know yet the exact amplitude for you to make the differential, but you can actually see quite well here. And the FF interval is irregular. But this is important because it's still considering the interatrial septum it's uh, uh, organized. And then if you go to AVL, it's a bit more organized compared to the previous one, but as you can see, it's more coarse compared to what we see here in the uh, interatrial septum. And look at V1, too, you see some form of organization of the uh, F wave. Obviously, we will see in a minute, it's important to, the, to do the differential between acute onset, so either paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation and uh, atrial flutter. You will see, but 
What is important, this is a functional reentry, and therefore the F way also, if they are organized, they are very, very fast, and the morphology is variable, and the FF uh, interval is variable. So let's do this differential. When you have a FIB and a, a atrial fibrillation or a atrial flutter, remember atrial flutter is an anatomical reentry, so it's well organized and is a anchor reentry all around this, the same circuit. The atrial fibrillation is a functional reentry, so it's moving around the atria, uh, and they are moving uh, around a, a non-excitable pore. Let's see, for example, this ECG. Look at the RR interval, are irregular, but then if you do some measurement, you can see that some of them are more regular. And if you go here, the F wave now have the same morphology and the same FF interval. If you measure then the atrial cycle length or the atrial rate, you will see that usually in dogs, it's less than 400 most of the time. If it's a tiny dog, it's less than 500. We could not find any atrial flutter defined by EP mapping, so electrophysiological mapping, with an atrial rate more than 500. So the cutoff to say, other than looking at the morphology, regularity, and same amplitude and same morphology that is classical for atrial flutter, remember always to measure the FF interval that should be less than 500 beats per minute for each dog. So you see here, for example, is 460. So again, should be always less than 500, most of the time less than 400. So it's very important then when you have atrial fibrillation and you compare it with atrial flutter, as I already told you, it's important to consider the morphology that should be always similar, repeatable in atrial flutter with the same FF interval less than 500. So, for example, this is again the atrial flutter, and this is the atrial fibrillation. You see, and I showed you in a, before, that the atrial activation also in the paroxysmal or in the persistent non long standing the f wave are very very rapid irregular ff interval and the amplitude is variable over time let's see this one here again so if you look at the interatrial septum here it's a flat F wave, you see, this is, it means that most of the time it's a long standing, persistent, or a permanent. If you try to cardiovert and you cannot succeed. So when you don't see the F wave, most of the time it's a long standing or permanent. When you see the F wave and you want to do the differential with atrial flutter, remember the rate, the amplitude, and the FF interval that are irregular. Look at the left atrium, still very irregular with a tiny F wave, so long standing persistent. And if you go to V1, again, flat with long standing persistent. But look what happened, for example, <clears throat> if you go in the left precordial, maybe some of us can say, oh, this is an atrial flutter. They look quite regular here to me and a very repeatable FF way and then if you go here is not the case. But again, remember to measure the FF interval. In this case was 93 millisec, so this atria was around 643 bit per minute. Remember, 500 is the cutoff to say it's an anatomical reentry, so flutter, or is a functional reentry, so atrial fibrillation. This is very, very important. So the acute atrial fibrillation is very rapid, irregular, chaotic, and usually lasts less than 48 hours. 
Usually in human, it's stored spontaneously within 28 hours in 50% of the patient. The risk increase with age, chronic valvular disease, alcohol abuse, diabetes, and lung disease. Let's see now an example of atrial fibrillation acute onset in a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel with, that came with acute onset dyspnea. So, and he has the classical mitral valve disease with the left apical basal murmur and irregular rhythm with pulse deficit. So now we are actually using, in some cases, with acute onset dyspnea, not requiring IV drugs. So it's a, you see it's a dyspnea, okay, it's, it, the, the dog is symptomatic, he has edema, mostly interstitial, severe interstitial edema. This is one of the dogs where you can solve the edema without using IV fluid. But if the dog is severely ill, you, sorry fluid, uh, IV diuretics. If the dog is uh, severely ill, in that case, you should use IV diuretic. This dog came in severe, uh, sorry, in moderate dyspnea, and this is the ECG. You see it's a narrow curious complex tachycardia with irregular RR interval. The heart rate was 214 beat per minute. Look at the QRS complex. It's a narrow one, 50 milliseconds. So it's a narrow QRS complex tachycardia. Irregular RR interval. And look for atrial activation sign. If you do the zoom in of the atrial of the lead two, so the interatrial septum, you can see that where you should see some P wave, you do not see them. So the, the positive is a T, 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 and T. And here, where you should have a P, you see a flattening of the F wave. But in some area, for example, here, you can see a, a motion more evident of the isoelectric line. So there are F way. Then suddenly the atrial fibrillation during the EC goes down and look how nicely now you can see quite well that there is an activation of the atria that is more organized. You can see it here in Li2. Look at how nicely you can see it. You cannot see in AVL, but something, yes, but not as good as lead, B, lead 2. Remember, this is the left atrium. And when the left atrium fibrillates also with an acute onset or a, a persistent, not long standing, you still have more disorganized activation. And then you have also in lead V1, some disorganized activation. So the interatrial septum usually is the one, so lead two is the one that you should use to have a rough idea if there's st still some organization, that means that is non long standing. So it's not permanent, it's not persistent long standing, it's paroxysmal. So we started in this dog, since he has a moderate uh, dyspnea, we started the high dose of torsemide once a day, you know, you can go up to 0.4 for five days, and then we move chronically to low doses to 0.2 once a day. Then we add Pimo, Benazapril, and Spironolactone as the usual dose. So we are now doing a study on the use of torsemide, so isamid, uh, uh, in dogs with dyspnea due to mitral valve disease and with some form of edema that can be uh, limited using torsemide orally. And we had good results uh, using that. We did a halter. So what happened during the halter? You can see that in the first part, you have an, a type of RR distribution that also changes here. And then suddenly you have another type of RR. So for sure, 
something changes here. So this is an acute onset AFib. So it's a paroxysmal AFib or a persistent AFib, but mainly a paroxysmal AFib. And we have the diagnosis because you see it on CP waves here, you see F way down here. So is a, a um, probably a, since you can see also on the ECG some kind of organization in lead to it's a persistent, it's, it's a paroxysmal, sorry, atrial fibrillation. Look at the tachogram, the difference in the tachogram exactly at this point. We will see what happens. So if you go here now, the, tachy, the if atrial fibrillation slows, and you can see now isoelectric line with some kind of organized F-way. Again, example of paroxysmal. And then if you move back here, now it's more regular, but still with some irregularity and no P waves and still F wave here. So again, atrial fibrillation. And finally, what happened in this point here? Look what happened. You have some form of organization here, then a P wave appear. So there is a, a, a spontaneous cardioversion. This is a classical feature of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And then you have again P, then you have an atrial ectopy, a sinus, some ectopic, a runs of a, a ventricular tachycardia, and then it remains into sinus rhythm. Obviously, it's a dog that has a high catecholamine. So when we treat the pulmonary edema with torsemide and then we add PIMO, benazapril and spironolactone, we decrease the catecholamine and this induces a, a cardioversion. So we usually suggest to treat the congestive heart failure first and then eventually to add digoxin or daltiazem depending on uh, if it's responding just to digoxin alone or if it's not, we add daltaizen. But in such a case, just treating congestion was enough to cardiovert AFib into sinus rhythm. So what is nice here, look at the P wave after cardioversion. It remains prolonged. It's almost 80 milliseconds. This is due not just to the enlargement, this is due to the presence of severe remodeling because of the left atrium dilation due to mitral valve disease. There are fibrosis, there is fibrosis, and this, together with the atrial fibrillation onset, it induces a slowing of the conduction that induces these key waves very, very prolonged and most of the time by feed, as you can see here. Again here, look at the P wave here, it's prolonged and by feet. Look at here, here. So let's see other type of classification other than the uh, paroxysmal, persistent, long-standing, persistent, and permanent. You can have most of the time atrial fibrillation is uh, secondary to Structural heart disease, as you can see here, and mitral valve disease is the most common. Then you have focal AFib. I'll show you some example of pulmonary vein firing in large brick dog inducing atrial fibrillation. So the, the main problem is the firing. So the ectopy is coming from the pulmonary vein. And this is a nice example of a firing from the pulmonary vein. Look at what happened here. You have P. QRS complex, and then you have this atrial activation here. And then you have this atrial activation, this one. Look at here, 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 here. It's just like a firing. You see, usually the firing happens across the QRS complex because the QRS complex is when the mitral valve is closed, and then you have a stretching of the left atrium that is already, in some case, fibrotic. And together with the fibrosis, you have this firing very, very fast, 600, 700 bit per minute. But then you still have some P sinus P wave. And so this is the sinus P, and then, then you get this firing. 
The firing is important because it's the one that induces atrial fibrillation. Look at in this example. Here is a, a dog with a normal heart rate, rate variability. P here, there is already a, a, a topic in the ST segment. Then here, firing, and then atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Look here, it looks very, very regular in morphology, but irregular in the RR inter in the FF interval. So, and since you can actually see the F wave, this is a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation induced by firing from the pulmonary vein. This is another nice example of firing. You can see at Holter, after a long pause, you have the QRS complex stretch of the uh, left atrium and the pulmonary veins leaves induce this firing. Look at how irregular and very, very fast it is. Here, another example, P, QRS complex, so sinus firing, and here you have the uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation because you see this form of organization, but it's still very, very rapid. It's more than 600 beats per minute. So it's important to remember that the pulmonary vein is the basis for having this firing because usually the pulmonary vein are uh, that you know go into the left atrium present some uh, alteration in the uh, echo in the structure. So there are some muscular sleeves coming from the left atrium that goes into the uh, pulmonary veins. We map pulmonary veins in dog with focal atrial fibrillation, and most of the focal AFib comes from the right superior and the left superior, here in the ostium or deep into the vein. Remember, there are some sleeves that goes from here to here. And in human, this is the most common pulmonary vein affected, so the right one and here the left one. And here is the incidence. Look, 82% is the right uh, uh, a and B, and you see 80 from 57 to 82 percent the left. And here is a for for the one of you that want to read a nice paper about pulmonary vein in dog and how to identify them using echocardiography. This is a paper from uh, Sydney Moise, and where you can see all the branches of the pulmonary vein. And focal AFib due to pulmonary vein firing has been found in dogs. So we had different cases in dogs. So this is an example where you can see that there is a part of the pulmonary vein that is intrapericardial, intra and then there is the extrapericardial. And the sleeves that comes, the, the muscular sleeves that come from the atria go into the vein, and this is where the firing starts. And look how nice you can see this is the pulmonary vein, adventitia, venus, and lumen, and you can see this is the sleeves of muscular, it is in direct, direct connection with the atria, with the left atrium. Here again, this is our old example of sleeves, and what is important, the orientation of the myofiber into the sleeves of the, of the, of the pulmonary veins are very, very or non-oriented, and that's why you can have this type of disorganization inducing firing and atrial fibrillation. So there is a study in human, they found that the changes in the pulmonary vein predisposed to AFib, the middle pulmonary vein uh, when present in human is associated to AFib, and there is no association between the common ostium and the atrial fibrillation found. Then you can have post-operative in dogs. The most common one is after pericardiocentesis, and then you can have also some form of inflammation due to myocarditis. So this is an example of post-operative AFib in a dog where they use 
uh, uh, fentanyl, high dose fentanyl. You know, high dose fentanyl because of the high vagal tone induce shortening of the action potential of the atrial cells and induce uh, also slowing of the uh, conduction within the atria. And that's why you have this paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. You see that you can see here also in the left atrium, in the interatrial septum, you can see the uh, amplitude, important amplitude. There is a paper where they show that the use of fentanyl can induce paroxysmal AFib, it's vagal induced in dog, and it can be treated using lidocaine. And this is another example of postoperative that was cardioverted after pericardiosynthesis using procainamide. So the sodium blocker prolonged the action potential in acute onset um, postoperative AFib, and so it, you can induce cardioversion. Then you have myocarditis. Myocarditis, we found several cases where viral myocarditis uh, induce uh, atrial fibrillation. And in dogs, we mainly found distemper and uh, parvoviruses and enteric coronaviruses. These are the three most common causes of myocarditis. Together with the bacterial one, it's Bartonella. We published a paper one or two years ago regarding this type of, uh, uh, of, of this study that we did. So what is important that when you have the viral inducing inflammation, you can either go to an heal, so nothing remain, or just a dilated cardiomyopathy due to scar, or you can still have some form of inflammation, this is a chronic myocarditis, or you can have actually the virus, and this is viral persistent. We have, we found that all dogs that has DCM due to myocarditis as a viral persistent with mainly distemper and parvoviruses. If some of you are interested also in this paper, just write me in Instagram or Facebook, we can send it to you, this paper about myocarditis in dogs. Then we publish also this other paper of narrowly mediated, so vagal atrial fibrillation. This, you can find it in a halter in dog with vasovagal syncope or situational syncope. So we uh, we will do a webinar about how to study syncope with Holter in the next months. I will uh, give you an update on that. But what happened, this is a particular form of, uh, of uh, syncope due to vasovagal. So you, there is a progressive slowing of the uh, sinus rate. Then you have sinus arrest. Here is when the dog lost posture, because this is the tremor, and then you have atrial fibrillation. Remember that the vagus is an enemy of the atria, and so this induce vagal atrial fibrillation. Usually vagal atrial fibrillation, this is another example here, usually atrial fibrillation are self-limiting in, in most of the cases that we see, but in some few cases, it can become persistent. So you need to intervene, trying to cardiovert into sinus rhythm. And this is another example, pose atrial fibrillation. Another example, progressive slowing, then he faint and atrial fibrillation. Look at the waves, always of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And then what happened is reorganized into a functional flutter that we also call, you can find it in our book, is called type 2 wells flutter. And then usually this is a very, very unstable flutter, still a functional reentry, very, very fast that go directly into sinus rhythm. Then we move to persistent atrial fibrillation. Persistent atrial fibrillation is usually present in dogs with underlying structural heart disease. And the, how you recognize it? Okay, again, you see there is a flattening of the F-way irregularity in lead 2, in lead ABL, in lead, in lead V1. But look at the QRS complex. The QRS complex become to start 
uh, is starting to be abnormal and we will go into it in a minute. So you see it's still narrow, but it's not spiky. You see it's going slowly up and slowly down. So this is called uh, slurring of the QRS complex. And I already put on my Instagram a, a short lecture about our peak time, our, one of our last paper where we measure the time of the contraction starting from the endocardium and going to the epicardium. How you should do it? Follow me, this is kind of easy. So you just draw a line starting from the peak of R in lead V1. This is the right ventricle. And then look how, how much late you have the R peak of the precordial, particularly V5. You see, usually they should be concomitant, maximum from 10 to 15 milliseconds late the left ventricle. But here you see it's almost 20, 25 milliseconds late. This is a sign of interventricular dyssynchrony, meaning that the left ventricle is thick. So it's dilated, fibrotic, and so it takes more time to reach the impulse from the endocardium to the epicardium. Try to do this, and in the future you will see, we, are pre we, are, we submitted a paper in Banda Branch block that will help you a lot in the understanding of of how to measure our peak time and the desynchrony index. Here, lead two, very irregular, very, uh, you know, flattening of the F way, interatrial septum, left atrium, AVL, and V1 is the right atrium that is also flat. So this is the main difference with persistent, the long-standing persistent has a flattening because there is more remodeling and less coordination in the uh, uh, activation complex. Let's see now one last part of this tracing. So usually during uh, in atrial fibrillation, you can have a change of the amplitude of the R wave. Look how nicely you can see it here. He has almost the same morphology, but is taller, as you can see here, here, and here. So two different morphology. This one, taller in uh, v, from V2 to, at least in V2, V3. And then you have this one that is less tall. So let's analyze the RR interval. And you can see that after longer pause, you have a wider, actually a taller QRS complex, while after a shorter pause, you have a less tall one. So what is the diagnosis for this? This is a form of intraventricular conduction disturbances that most of the time is related to the presence of some form of what we call aberrancy. Aberrancy, so it's a bundle branch block dependent on the rate. Another possible explanation is what we call Brody effect. So the Brody effect is the change in the amplitude of the QRS complex depending on the feeling. The more the ventricle is filled, the taller the RR wave is. So this is another option. So it can either be a slowing due to aberrancy, more likely, or a Brody effect. Usually Brody effect is less regular. Here is very regular, so the aberrancy can be the first option. So we call it phase three aberrancy. So during the faster rate, there is more aberrant beat. During the slower rate, there is more feeling and there is a taller uh, R uh, weights. The sustain, when you have more than two beats, this is linking. So linking is when you have aberrancy sustains more than one beat. I posted on Instagram and Facebook, uh, the last uh, diagnostic corner was about 
it, the differential diagnosis for linking. If the one of you that I haven't seen it, I think it, it's, it's nice to, to have a look on that too. So remember that usually when you have in atrial fibrillation, it's very common what we call the Ashman phenomena. So after a short, long, short, when you have the short, you have a aberrancy, usually phase three aberrancy. When you have more than one, there is a perpetuation of the functional block. This is called linking. Why do we have linking? Because during the previous beat that is blocked, then you have the retrograde conduction that will prolong this uh, branch. And so the following beat will still find uh, the branches block. And so that's why you have linking. So the first one is blocked because of the uh, uh, rate dependent aberrancy, but then the retroconduction will prolong this refractory period, and so the next bit will still find this branch block. So to finish, I want to show you just one thing that we will talk in, in our next, in the number three ECG round in early September, that is going to be around ventricular arrhythmia. So here is a dog with a, a sinus rhythm with a, a prolonged PQ interval. But look what happened here. We have a wide QRS complex with AV dissociation. So you see the P is dissociated. So, okay, so this is a ventricular beat, obviously because there is a V dissociation. Second, because you see it does not respond to the rule of van der Branch block. So this is a left van der Branch block in lead two, three, and AVF. So if it's a left band of branch block, it should be positive from V2 to V6. And this is not the case. So this is ventricular because there is a V dissociation and because there is no rule of the precord, no concordance between precordial and limb leads. We will discuss this in the next one. I'm going to show you this because it's interesting that when we think about aberrancy, we think about aberrancy just in, in during supraventricular rhythm, but you can also have aberrancy induced by ventricular rhythm. For example, here you see now that this QRS complex that comes after this P wave and prolonged P wave, this now responds to the rule of left band of branch block because it's positive in two, three, to one, two, three, and AVF, and from V2 to V6. Then is negative in AVR and is negative in V1. So this is an example of aberrancy due to a, a this ectopy that falls into previous. And this is a again an example of linking because this is the first beat and this is a second beat. And when you have more than one beat on a row, this is called linking, is a phase three linking. I think this ECG is quite nice because you have a comparison between a bead here that is ventricular, because you see that is not, here is positive, but then here is negative, and this is supraventricular with aberrancy, because now here is positive, here is positive, AVR is negative, V1 is negative. So we will talk about uh, ventricular arrhythmias in our next ECG round. If you want to participate, it's going to be the 9th of September 9th. Uh, still on uh, uh, live streaming on Facebook in our canine and feline study group and on blue jeans uh, uh, with the SIVA support. Here again, our contact, our Instagram phase, and for the one of you that are not registered, if you want to discuss arrhythmia with us, this is the canine and feline arrhythmia study group. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you.